Hello, screenwriters. I hope everyone is doing well, that you're hitting your personal deadlines, uh, attaching big name talent, and getting that option sold. I wanted to take a moment to look back at a series that we are doing here on the ISA and on our Pro Tips and Tricks page and our YouTube page that we're right now, we're calling it First Impressions. And the idea is taking an iconic movie and, and taking a look at the first five pages, the first, the opening sequences of a movie that we have grown to love, that has become something of a modern classic. And we want to see how does the screenwriter introduce the world of this screenplay, of this story, uh, because so much is established at the very beginning of a movie. You might call it the hook. You might have a whole bunch of different words for it. But it's really fascinating to see, and not only is it fascinating to see how you establish the characters and the world and the basic premise, the tone, all of that really quickly, but it's also really fun to see what has changed even from the final script, the one that went to set, the shooting script, versus what we ended up with in theaters, because there's still some alternate takes. There are scenes that were cut or added, and in some of the cases, we try to understand why these changes were made. Two that we've done in the past that I'm not going to go into right now are the original Scream movie, uh, which was brilliantly written, and also Free Guy. And with Free Guy, what we did was we took a look at the screenplay that won the blacklist that was such a highly regarded and celebrated screenplay, but even for a screenplay that is that high highly rewarded and respected what happens well, a new writer is brought in to punch it up and get it ready for the next stage. So it was very fun to take a look at the Blacklist award-winning screenplay versus what went to screen, and there's still a ton of changes in there. And again, we try to understand why those changes were made, even on a screenplay that had won some major awards. And in all of these videos, I ask some questions at the beginning and end of it, things that are really... Ideally, it would get some discussion going, but at the very least, it's thought-provoking. It might make you think about things, might make you think about your own screenplays, and there's no better place to start than with the most recent one we did, which just came out a couple days ago, and that is taking a look at the 1986 film Top Gun. Boy, I wonder why we're talking about Top Gun right now. But the screenplay was a lot of fun to look at, very interesting to, to see. And as this video series is about screenplay formatting, I found it really interesting that in the first draft, now we use the second draft in our video, but in the first draft, there was a note uh, between the cover page and the beginning of the script. I kind of did some graphic designer work and uh, made it look like it was a, a post-it note here. But when we are talking about screenplay formatting, something that can be difficult is, well, what if you have a guy in a cockpit, he's got a co-pilot behind him, they are frequently talking to each other, and then just as quickly, a button is hit and that same character is talking into his radio to someone else. How do you differentiate that? And it could make the screenplay ex exponentially longer if you're constantly calling out that now he picks up the mic and is talking to the radio. Well, what they did was they just said, if the dialogue is in all caps, that means it's going into the radio, either plane to plane or plane to the aircraft carrier. Aerial dialogue in small caps is the inter-cockpit system. And it's neat to see that, yes, you can, right at the beginning, create your own rules for how the screenplay should be read and understood, which is what they did here in the movie Top Gun. I thought this could be an opportunity to also talk a little bit about who these writers are. Uh, it's very easy to find another version of the screenplay online, a first draft by a man named Chip Prozer, and he is not credited at all as part of the writing team for Top Gun. He wrote a couple of other 80s movies, Inner Space with Martin Short, which was such a fun one, and uh, Iceman, which is a little bit of a uh, big at its time and, and kind of forgotten today. But it is interesting to note that in this era, the Don Simpson era, and of course Don Simpson did uh, executive produce Top Gun. He also did a lot of the action movies of the late 80s into the 90s. Uh, the Beverly Hills Cop movies, uh, Days of Thunder, uh, getting back to Tom Cruise, uh, The Rock, Dangerous Minds, Crimson Tide, a lot of bigger, I mean, he was a big high concept guy, uh, that he had producers working on his screenplays. So Chip Prozer was somebody that d did have a bigger uh, repertoire, a bigger resume as a behind the scenes person and as we see here, the name Warren Scarin, he also is a guy that has a, a lot more producing under his belt and as part of who he is, his, his professional career. He is a guy that was from Texas who started to work to get films to come and shoot in Texas. And one of the movies that he helped make happen and had an actual investment in was the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But interestingly, his notable writing also includes Beverly Hills Cop 2, Beetlejuice, uh, 1989's Batman, and he even did write a sequel to Beetlejuice, which I would love to get my hands on that, called Beetlejuice in Love. So right away, and we don't get into the filmmaking very much, but it is interesting to note that 
for even in a big budget movie, and this of course was a big budget movie, uh, there were limitations that you see pulled out of the screenplay immediately. The movie opens, as we know, with this montage of jets taking off and landing, which is also good to see for the audience to kind of understand what normal life looks like on the on an aircraft carrier. But the opening sequence was written uh, differently. It involved a plane crash on the decks, and also it took place in a whole different part of the world, uh, Norway as opposed to the Indian Ocean, during a massive storm. So look how much easier this is to film if you're not having to deal with the high waves, the wind, the, the, the crashing rain. Also, and again, not at all having to do with structure or storytelling, there's perhaps no song more associated between a movie and the song as Danger Zone, Highway to the Danger Zone as Top Gun. But as we see here, it was actually written into the screenplay as a car song, Ride Me High. There's nothing important about that, but I think that is just fun to see. So the questions I was asking people to consider when looking at the beginning of the movie Top Gun uh, are, are really two things. One, basically the entire beginning of this movie is an action sequence. It's a dogfight between uh, two different sets of jets going back and forth at each other. How is character begun to establish when it seems like action is really driving anything? You don't have time, it seems, it might seem, to establish character. But even in this brief moment, where we see more action than conversation, that character is still established. One, you see that Goose is silly. I mean, it's right there in the name. What a silly Goose he is, uh, as campy as that is for me to say right now, but it's true. Um, and also Maverick being a Maverick, other pilots are telling him to be careful. These guys are people that are putting their lives on the line all the time, and they're telling this guy to be careful. So he must be an amplified version of the biggest adrenaline junkie out there. The other thing I like to point out in this is in the screenplay, it's all in the air. We see the bridge of the aircraft carrier very briefly at the beginning of the screenplay, and then not again. It's all just the pilots talking back and forth and the action. But what is gained from the fact that they cut back to the bridge way more frequently in the actual movie, where you see the guys at the radar screens, you hear the commander talking to them, you hear their discussions. What's going on there? is amplifying the importance of what's going on in the sky. Also, in my opinion, I love to see the frenetic action, the the the, uh, the chaotic pace of what's going on in the sky. Meanwhile, we have stationary, locked-off shots, close-ups, not a lot of action when it comes to the bridge, just people talking. And I think that juxtaposition really works well to make those action scenes seem even more frenetic and busy. That said... There are certainly ways that that could go wrong. You have to make sure that the scene you're cutting away to is just as important in a different way than what's going on up in the sky. So that is something to think about as a writer. Cut away from the action, maybe more than you inherently want to, but then make that thing you're cutting to be just as important as the action. As with all of these things, that's just my two cents. I would love to hear you all make comments on these videos, on this video, on the first impressions videos. There's no right answers. It is all an opinion, and um, and I love to hear anybody else's take on it. Man Alive adaptation is one of my favorite movies ever. Uh, just really, really, really a great movie. Um, I would say it's my favorite Nick Cage movie as well. I'm sure a lot of that is because I'm a writer as well. So maybe too much of it feels relatable uh, to how we beat ourselves up as writers or how we reward ourselves. There is a lot of that for writers in this screenplay and film. Similarly to the idea of cutting away, this is a screenplay that does the opposite. If you know the movie, you know that there is this guy, this writer named Charlie Kaufman, who is struggling to adapt a book. Meanwhile, we see Susan Orlean, the writer of the book, and what's going on in her personal life. What he thinks she is and what she, he thinks she's about is very different from the reality. And so there is an element of cutting back and forth between the two things. And of course, they do meet up as he's trying to reach out to her to understand better how to adapt her book. And as it's written, that's happening immediately. We see some of his life and we see some of her life. But in the finished film, we see only uh, Charlie Kaufman, Nick Cage's character, for the first five or more minutes of this movie. So the ultimate decision must have been that we really, really, really need to establish uh, Charlie Kaufman uh, to fully understand who he is because he's a very cerebral person before branching outside of his world. And I do love that how part of it is done is seeing him on the set of 
a movie that he had already produced, the movie being John, or written, I should say, being John Malkovich, where he is somebody that's just kind of in the way and and shoot away from his very own movie uh, because nobody really knows who he is. Also, he doesn't stand up for himself. So a lot of character, a ton of character happens right there. Where else does character happen? It happens within the narration where you're hearing his own thoughts. And they very famously make fun of it within the movie itself that they're using too much narration. Narration, obviously, can be a really great thing. I love the movie Casino. Casino is full of narration, even up to the point that Joe Pesci's character gets hit at one point and you hear the narrator voice react, which is a little bit weird. But still, narration can be a very good thing as long as you're using it for the right ways. And I think deciding what the right way is, well, I guess you can tell me which way is the right way, which way is the wrong way. My answer to that is... Are you being lazy by using narration? Is there a better way to convey something? And sometimes narration is absolutely the best way. Sometimes you have to get that exposition out and it would be a whole nother movie if you had to write all the scenes to cover it all. And in this movie, it's really about character development, especially at the beginning of this movie here. We also took a look at one of the movies that was, oh my gosh. I mean, it's a, a triumph in filmmaking. It's very hard to watch, but in a good way, in a, a powerful way, in a way where we see how impactful screenwriting and filmmaking can be. And that is Requiem for a Dream. And as I was taking a look at this, I realized that really the, the opponent in the movie, the bad guy, if you will, is drugs and addiction itself. There isn't some, some villainous entity that is coming in and affecting these people. It's their own uh, struggles with addiction and different types of addiction. So it's interesting to see how quickly, in a movie that's some, something of an ensemble too, that we do have some major storylines, a couple different major storylines that we're looking at. How quickly can you establish all of these people together, even with them having different addictions, that they are all completely flawed people? It's very easy to make negatively flawed people not interesting or not relatable or people that it's it's easy to disengage and, and step back from it. Darren Aronofsky does something here where even though they are despicable in a lot of ways, you somehow end up rooting for them and hoping for the best for them. Even though there's this constant overbearing sense of dread and hopelessness, which you would think if you establish dread and hopelessness as your theme, why would you keep watching? It's the characters. The characters really drive it. And so it is interesting to see just from the very, very, very beginning of this movie how even while they're not in their brightest moments, that there's still something a little bit engaging about them. And again, this is one where I'm not going to say I have the answers for how did he do this so well? How was this so well executed? You all take a look and let me know what you think. How was this done so well? And this is a movie I haven't seen probably since college because it is a tougher one to watch. But it made me want to watch it again, just watching the first few minutes of it, because I was immediately hooked all over again, even though I know what the rest of the movie is going to be like. I, Tanya, I'm not going to dive into really hard, because the question is about the cover page. Based on the irony-free, wildly contradictory, totally true interviews with Tanya Harding and Jeff Gluley. Um, and then, yeah, there's the question, how much can you establish about the tone of a movie or any other element of the movie, the screenplay, even before page one? I remember very famously the movie American Pie titled their movie something along the lines of uh, teen sex comedy that your assistants won't like, but I assure you will make a lot of money. Something along those lines. A raunchy teen comedy, a lot of people might not see the, the value in that, that it can be a summer hit, a big blockbuster type of movie, a something about Mary type of movie. That movie made tons of money as well. You are establishing your tone as a writer, what voice you have, even in a silly title like that. It doesn't fit everywhere. I, Tanya did it a little bit differently. Maybe they hedged their bets a little bit, give it an actual name. And he could just say, based on actual interviews with Tanya Harding and Jeff Galuli, that kind of implies also that some rights are already established and that we have some life rights to work with, which does give your screenplay more value. But the fact that you're calling it irony-free, wildly contradictory, totally true interviews, that immediately makes it more interesting from before page one. Let's just take a look at one more. Again, one from my college days. I'm totally dating myself here. And I meant to bring this up in the movie adaptation, so much foreshadowing happens. That's another reason I love that movie so much. In adaptation, in his first meeting with his publisher, he goes on and on about what he doesn't want his book to be. 
what he doesn't want it to be about. He doesn't want it to include car chases or flowers as a metaphor for drugs. And of course, the movie becomes all of these things he doesn't want it to be. It's tremendous foreshadowing. And there's some foreshadowing, of course, in Fight Club. If you've seen Fight Club, you know there's a big twist that is set up throughout the movie subtly. So right away, there's a little bit of foreshadowing, even from the deletion. Not that the audience can see this, but as we, the readers, can see it. Uh, Tyler has one arm around Jack's shoulder. The other hand holds a handgun with the barrel lodged in Jack's mouth. Tyler is sitting in Jack's lap. So for one, that would just be some weird blocking, kind of difficult to light one guy on the other guy's lap with the gun. It would it would be very awkward to begin with. But also, when you know... Spoilers, if you haven't seen Fight Club, when you find out later that Jack and Tyler are the same person... Um, this shot makes more sense that you could be doing this to yourself uh, as opposed to arm around the shoulder. It really identifies them as two different people. This, just having the gun like this, is more natural for a threatening action. So right away, your typical, like the first thing you learn when you get into uh, screenwriting, show, don't tell. Uh, in the screenplay, they're just looking out the window, whereas in the finished film, we get all of these shots showing us all the rigging that they've done for this Project Mayhem, this this big grand finale that they've planned. Uh, stuff that's not written in the screenplay, but we certainly see it in the finished film. Anyway, that's a little peek at what we've been doing over in our first impressions section. Uh, you should also check it out over on Instagram, ISA Pro Tips, where there's some there that aren't on YouTube, including the TV show Glow. That show kicked off their series so well so much was done right in the first five minutes and you can almost mark it at the five minute point boom i get the show fully i'm on board with these characters and what's going on uh really really well done but as you can see the ghostbusters is how we kicked it off matrix kingsman secret service independence day as i mentioned free guy uh, Euphoria, the pilot from that. We do some television as well. Uh, the Blind Side did a really good job with immediate character development. Check out those videos if you haven't already, and please do begin a dialogue there because there's a lot of interesting concepts for screenwriters to discuss. And I would love to know what you disagree with from me, how you would handle things a certain way, or if you ever see anything in here where you say, wow, I wish they didn't change that how it was written was better. They shouldn't have made the alteration. I'd love to see any viewpoints like that in there as well. As always, thank you to the ISA and Final Draft. For now, that's a wrap, and we'll see you on the next one.